All right. Go ahead and find a seat. Kids, you are off to class. Loudly, they're off to class. Well, let me just say this. I, you know, there's, I know there's some here that have only recently started attending Calvary Parkside, and so you walked into a family moment this morning. For those of us that have been here for many years, uh, we are mourning the loss of a, of, a, of a brother, a family member of our church, uh, Kurt Lynham. Kurt was on our board actually for a couple years before we switched over to uh, elders. He was on the church board and he served on the personnel committee and Bev, was, Bev uh, is one of our tellers and so they highly involved here at Calvary Parkside and so uh, we, are, we are mourning this morning. But there, there's, there's tension in this. I was, I was, as we were meeting, James and Larry and I were meeting, it, it struck me that there's tension in this morning. Because our first core value, what we are all about, why we exist, why we're here this morning, is to worship God passionately, joyfully, right, with excitement. And so how do you do that? How do you, how do you come on a Sunday morning excited to be in the presence of God knowing what's happening, what has happened as we, again, mourn the loss of a brother in Christ. Well, I'll just say this. Kurt, Kurt's not mourning. Right? Kurt's where, Kurt, he, he's probably looking down thinking, wow, why couldn't I have done this sooner? Right? Not because he didn't love his family, but because he is now in the presence of his Savior. And so we somehow are wrestling with that loss, but yet are excited for Kurt to be in the presence of God. And so I would ask that now as we open up his word, let's open it again with with open eyes and open hearts and excitement for what God's going to show us this morning the truth of God's word that Kurt is now living out in his own life. You know, we're, we're starting this, this I Am series, and um, the first I Am we're going to look at, uh, I was going to share this later, I'm going to share it now, is, oddly enough, it's, it's called the bread of life, right? God's sovereignty orchestrated this, right? Not this, what, what happened on Friday did not surprise God at all. So it's almost like he orchestrated this. He said, oh, we're going to preach on the bread of life, We're going to talk about the bread of life on Sunday. Let me give you an example of the value, of the importance, of the eternal importance of the bread of life because Kurt is in heaven because of the bread of life. He's in heaven because Jesus came and offered to the world bread, eternal bread that would fill whatever it is that they were going through, that would give them purpose and meaning and an eternal perspective. And so I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John this morning as we dive into God's Word. Last week on Easter Sunday, we wrapped up a seven-week series called The Seven Signs and Miracles of Jesus, also from the Gospel of John. So we're going to stay in this book. I, I love the Gospel of John. In fact, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one there in front of you, a blue Bible. Uh, take that home with you, and I would encourage you to open it up and to just dive in and start reading through the book of John because John provides us with, with a snapshot of who Jesus was, is, why he came, his purpose, his death, his resurrection. And so it's an amazing book, and so we're just going to stay in it. We spent seven weeks in it, and we're going to stay in it because there's so much rich value Rich theology in the Gospel of John. But we spent the last seven weeks talking about these signs and miracles of Jesus. And now we're going to flip gears. And we're going to talk about these I am statements. Now, the the miracles, the signs, right, they were actions that Jesus did. Right? They were events in the life of Jesus. Now we're going to look at his words. That's the difference between these two seven-week series that we're going through. Right? The signs and miracles were used by Jesus to show his, his divine power, to demonstrate his authority. 
to show some of God's character. But he used his words to define who he was, who he is. Because Jesus was more than just a magician, right? a wonder worker, a great teacher. Jesus was and Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. Again, signs and miracles, understand the difference. Signs and miracles used to authenticate his message as coming from God. But signs and wonders are not enough for salvation. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing the message. Not seeing the message, hearing the message. Not that miracles can't bring us closer to Jesus, but it's his words that save us. The message is heard through the word about Christ. And as we're going to see this morning, the crowd that we're going to look at, they're, they're going to be the front and center. They're like the, the stars of today's show, right? This crowd, this multitude, they're a perfect example of the truth of Romans. They're a perfect example of why signs and miracles are not enough in our lives. That we need to hone in on the words of Jesus. Psychologists tell us that in order to, in order to truly know someone, we have to move beyond, we have to look beyond the external details of someone's life. Right? We can know all about what they did, right? their accomplishments, their achievements. I mean, think back to your, you know, your favorite historical character. Could be a politician, could be a sports star, could be a, a, you know, a scientist. Right? Uh, who, who do you go to? Who do you gravitate to? Who do you study? And usually when we do that, it, we, we study their actions, right? We want to know about their accomplishments. What did they do? But psychologists tell us that's not how you really get to know somebody. To get to know somebody, you really need to sit across from them, if possible, and listen to their words. Allow them to tell you who they are. And that's what Jesus does for us in the book of John. He tells us. He shows us, but even more than that, he tells us exactly who he is. And that goes to the question I closed with last week, right? The question of Easter. Who is Jesus to you? And one way for us to answer that question is to listen. As Jesus describes for us through these I am statements. And through these I am statements, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. He's going to tell us not only who he is, but he's also going to tell us what he can do for us and what we can become through him. Right? If, if, if you're spiritually hungry, again, this morning, he offers you the bread of life. If you're walking in darkness, if you're unsure of the next step you are to take in your life, if you're trying to figure out, okay, what am I supposed to do? God offers you a light. He gives light to the darkness. He, and he is the light of life. So we can live without fear. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the great I am. And with these two simple words, I am, he addresses our greatest doubts, fears, and pain. So John, go ahead and turn to chapter 6. That's where we're going to be this morning as we look at this first I am statement. Let me give you a little background into these two simple yet life-changing words. I am was the name God identified himself by when he, was with, when he uh, showed himself to Moses in the burning bush. If you've been around church at all, you probably have heard the story of Moses in the burning bush, right, where God talks to, to Moses and he tells Moses, okay, here's, here's, here's what I need you to do. I know you've been running from me, okay, for the last 40 years. It's time now for you to, to go back to Egypt where you fled. I need you to go back to Egypt. And you're going to lead my people. You're going to lead my people out of slavery and into the promised land. And so Moses says, okay, if I'm going to do this, I got I to gotta know, I got to be able to tell the people who this is that's sending me. Right? Who, who should I tell them is going to deliver them? Who are you? God, what is your name? And God simply says, tell them, I am sent you. I am sent you. 
Now, if, if you were to come up to me on Sunday morning, you're new, right? You're just visiting. You come and say, hey, what, what's your name? I am. You'd probably think, what in the world? What kind of church did I just walk into? All right, what do you, well, I am, okay, I am. I get that. I am what? Right, because that's what we do, right? We take that I am and we, we add adjectives to it. Right? I am a husband, right? I am a father. I am someone who likes sports. I am someone who eats tacos as many days as I can during the week, right? I am someone who, right? We like to add adjectives to that. But yet here God simply says, I am. Why? Because words cannot define God. Adjectives don't do God justice. Because God has no beginning and no ending. He is outside of time, matter, and space, and yet He is inside of time, matter, and space. Right? God does not change. And God is here with us and for us. And so that's why He tells Moses, you know what, the only thing you need to know is I am, is here for you. And from that moment on, in the nation of Israel's journey from Egypt to the promised land, whenever Israel had a need, God would invoke the name I am, and then he would attach an attribute to it that would meet Israel's need. For example, when Israel was hungry, and when they were afraid, they called on God and God said, okay, Jehovah Jireh is here, right? I am your provider. When the Israelites were sick because they drank water from a poison well, God called and said, Jehovah Rapha is here. I am your healer. And here in the Gospel of John, Jesus is going to take that name, I am, and he's going to apply it to seven human needs. And in doing so, he's going to let everyone know exactly who he is. That I am not just the son of Joseph a carpenter. I am not just a great teacher. I am not just someone who goes around and you know, turns water into wine. I am the son of God. I am the Messiah. And so this first statement we're going to look at here in John 6 comes not long after the miracle where Jesus fed 5,000 plus, right? 5,000 men, but also women and children. So there were more than 5,000 there, and he does this with just five loaves of bread and two fish. But I mentioned earlier that while the feeding of the 5,000 revealed the power of Jesus and it met a physical need, that wasn't why he performed that miracle. It wasn't just about showing his power. He also wanted to deliver a profound message to the multitude on the, on the hillside and to you and to me. He wanted to tell everybody who he was. And so he makes a statement, I am the bread of life. Well, let's dive into that. What, what, what does all that mean? We'll go back to verse 14 here of John 6. We got, we got to set a little bit of context. We got to paint a picture before we get to that statement. John 14 says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, and that sign he performed was the miracle of the bread and the the loaves of bread and the fish, they said to themselves, surely, surely, okay, this is a prophet, because they knew their Old Testament prophecy, this is a prophet who is come into the world. If anyone can do what this guy just did, he must be the prophet. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So what did the crowd see? It said, after the people saw the sign, what really had they seen? Had they seen Jesus take five loaves and two fish and extend it to 5,000 plus people and fed them and then taken up 12 baskets after that? Had he done that? Yeah, but he really did so much more than that. You see, Jesus performed this miracle during Passover, which was the feast that the Jews used to mark the date that they were freed from slavery. So imagine this, you're on that hillside, a thousand years removed from Israel being in captivity in, in Egypt and being delivered by Moses and receiving manna from heaven. And here you are thou, thousands of years later. And once again, you're under oppression. Not Egyptian oppression, this time you're under Roman oppression. And all of a sudden this guy comes along named Jesus. 
and he's doing, he's doing things that Moses did. Right? He's, he's doing some miracles. He's bringing, he's, he's bringing manna to them. He's bringing bread to them. He's doing miraculous things with bread. The same things that Moses did in the wilderness. So naturally Israel's ready. They're like, hey, okay, here we go. This is, this is our New Testament Moses. This is what we have been waiting for. Let's make him king because he's going to lead us. Just like Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, Jesus is going to lead us from, out from under Roman oppression. That's what, that's what they're thinking. But that wasn't the point of the miracle. Okay, let's keep reading. Drop, drop down now to verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake. Now, I need to, I need to fill in some gaps here without reading uh, all the text. So the, the gap here is this, right? It says at the end of verse 15 that Jesus withdrew himself to a mountain. Well, while he's on this mountain by himself, the disciples get in a boat and they're crossing the lake, right, to get to the other side. And that's when this storm hits, right? Jesus ends up walking on water, right? And that's, that's a whole other miracle. He ends up walking on water and rescues them. And so now he's on the other side in Capernaum. And that's where this crowd finds him, right? Because they, 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 they don't want to give up. They want more. It says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Now, I love the fact that Jesus totally, totally just pushes their question aside. Because the question was this, hey Jesus, when did you get here? And he didn't say, oh yeah, about an hour ago, about 10 minutes, been here all day, where have you been? He doesn't even answer the question. He's like, that's not what you're asking. You're asking when I get here, but that's not really what you're asking. And and that's why he says, I tell you, you are looking for me not because. You don't want to know when when I got here because you want to know when I got here. You're asking that because you want to know if you missed anything. Because you saw the signs I performed earlier. And you want more. You've eaten your fill and you're ready. You're ready for another miracle. Jesus goes on in verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils. In other words, don't follow me around looking for more physical bread. Don't follow me around looking for me to turn water into wine. Don't follow me around looking for the next miracle. Right? That's just going to spoil. It's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. But look for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him, God the Father has placed His seal of approval. Then they asked Him, well, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this. The work of God is this, to believe in the one He has sent. So they asked Him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Again, the crowd is just completely missing the point. Right? Jesus makes these, he gives this credential there in verse 29, right? The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. In other words, that's me. Right, he's making this claim, I am sent from God. And so because of that, right, they, they want another sign. Right, again, they want another miracle. Verse 31, our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness. Right, how about that? Okay, yeah, the, it was a cool trick with the five loaves and two fish in the baskets. What about raining down bread from heaven? Right, like Moses. They, they wanted another sign. It wasn't good enough. They just wanted more and more. The crowd, I mean, let's be be honest here. The crowd, they didn't want Jesus. They didn't want Jesus. They wanted another miracle. They didn't want Jesus. They wanted their physical needs met. They wanted their physical needs met in miraculous ways. They didn't want Jesus. They just wanted what Jesus could give them. And that, to them, was miracles. So listen to how Jesus responds to this materialistic whim Right? The crowd thinks Jesus is at our whim to, to do our beck and call. Listen to 
Jesus' answer in verse 32. Verily, truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So first Jesus is going to rebuke them for their lack of history. Okay, and say, oh, by the way, Moses did not bring down manna from heaven. God sent you manna from heaven, number one. Number two, now there's true bread that God has sent you. And this bread from heaven is what will give life to the world. This bread that God has sent gives life to the world, to everybody, not just to Jews, but to everyone. Which brings us to a question and answer by Jesus. A question by the crowd, an answer by Jesus. And this is the heart of our morning. Verse 34, sir, they said. It's interesting that they, they changed that because in, the, in verse 25 it was rabbi. Now they've gone to, from rabbi to sir. Okay? From rabbi to sir because now they're questioning what's going on. Who is this guy? Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Yeah, we want the bread that gives life to the world. Then Jesus declared, he, here's his I am statement. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me, right? And you still do not believe. Remember I talked about this earlier, right? As I called you to say, it, it, to know somebody is not just to understand their actions and, and see what they do, right? Because they saw what Jesus did. They followed him around. They saw his actions. But yet Jesus says it right here, and still you do not believe. In other words, you still don't know who I am, do you? You still don't know who I am. Verse 36. I'm sorry, verse 37. All those, can okay, let me just explain it to you. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. I will raise them up at the last day. Now, I'm sure there's those sitting here this morning that read verse 37, and you've read verse 37 before, and so you're thinking to yourself, okay, what's Doug going to do with this one? All right, let's read it. Again, I, I, I'd love to keep going, on, keep going, but I, I probably should talk a little bit about this verse because there's so much here. Verse 37 all those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. In this one verse, John packs an entire theological truth. One single verse, John paints this huge theological truth. He gives us two perspectives of salvation. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Some would call this the doctrine of election. Right, man's, God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, right? The first part is God's sovereignty, right? All those the Father gives me, right? The those in that verse is commonly referred to as the elect. You maybe have heard that, right? God's elect. Man's responsibility is found in the last part. Whoever comes to me. Now, these are two truths that appear to contradict each other, right? God's elect those who come to God, those, those appear on the surface to contradict one another, but I don't, I, I don't believe they do. Let me explain it like this. I believe these are two truths held in tension. Even though they, they seem to contradict each other, I, I believe they actually operate in tension. Let me explain it. It's like a suspension bridge. Okay, if you've ever driven across the Golden Gate Bridge, if you've ever walked across the suspension bridge, right, those bridges are held together by tension. Tension has to happen in order for you to get from San Francisco on one side to Sausalito on the other side. The Golden Gate has to be in tension. 
I think here in verse 37 of John 6, he's saying that God's divine election, along with human responsibility, is necessary for salvation to work as God intended. Not just work, okay? Because that would mean that we play a role. Okay? It means that we're as important as God. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they have to work together for salvation to happen as God intended it to happen. Because he doesn't need us. He doesn't need us. Now, there's, there's all kinds of opinions on this. Right? There's the, the, the big words, there's Calvinists and there's Arminians and they have different beliefs on God's elect and all that. I get that there's various opinions. Right? And even if you believe in, in election, there's even varying degrees to that. And so, let me just, let me just say this and, and then we'll move on. Because no one can fully understand the mind of God, right? Because we can, we can argue this, we can debate this, we can dive in and, and unpack all the different nuances of this, but we're never going to fully understand it. Kurt does, okay? But we, right now, will never fully understand the mind of God. And so let me just say this. Man's responsibility does not override God's sovereignty, Man's responsibility does not override God's sovereignty, and God's sovereignty is not dependent on man's responsibility. Man's responsibility does not override God's sovereignty, and God's sovereignty is not dependent on man's responsibility. But what is man's responsibility? I think 40, verse 44 unpacks that for us. So, Jesus said this, No one can come to, to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. That drawing is, is the Holy Spirit guiding. Okay, now again, they don't have the Holy Spirit yet because they're not saved, but the Holy Spirit is still working. Right? And so man's responsibility is to fulfill the drawing of being drawn to God. Now, again, I, I could spend an hour on this, and I'm sure I've confused you, which was kind of my point. Because then you're going to want to know more. And so when, when we teach this at a Calvary Institute class, and when we preach on Sunday morning, you'll come because you want to know more about this. So my point was to confuse you. Awesome. Right. No, I mean, it's hard. Right? It's one of those, those things that, again, we, we can't fully understand. We can't fully comprehend. But what we can comprehend is, is the last part of verse 37. And I'll, I'll just say this and then we'll move on. Whoever comes to me, that last part... I will never drive away. If you ever wondered, is my salvation secure? There it is. The assurance of salvation. Jesus says it. I will. You come to me. Father gives you to me. It doesn't matter. Just know this. I will never lose you. I will never drive you away. Our salvation is secure. The assurance of salvation is spelled out right there. And that's so comforting to know. It's so comforting to know that no matter what I do, I can never lose my salvation. God holds on to it. Jesus holds on to it tight. But let's move on. Let's, let's, go on. let's move on to it in this short little sermon that Jesus is preaching to the crowd. He's basically saying this. Guys, you've got bigger problems than Roman oppression you got bigger problems than maybe being hungry, right? Needing some physical bread and some fish. Because what you have is an empty spiritual stomach. Your spiritual soul is starving. You have a spiritual hunger, and it's a hunger that only I can fill. Only I can fill it, and it's not with physical bread. Again, he talked about their, uh, in, he talked about their, in verse 27, right? Do not work for food that spoils. Physical bread will not satisfy. But you know what will satisfy? And better yet, who will satisfy? I am. I am. Because I am the bread of life. And I've been sent by my Father to do His will to provide eternal life. So again, Jesus is saying to the crowd, you don't need another miracle. Could I give you another miracle? Sure I could. You asked for a sign, could I give you one? Sure, but that's not what you need. You don't need another sign. You don't need another miracle. What you need is the miracle worker. 
what you need is Jesus. And maybe you're here this morning and you're hoping for a miracle in your life. You're hoping that Jesus heals your physical problems. You're hoping that Jesus provides relief from the pain and stress of your job or your family. Right? That Jesus will do this miracle in your life. Here's my challenge to you this morning. Instead of praying for a miracle, pray for more of Jesus. Instead of praying for an action by Jesus, pray for more of Jesus in your life. Because I believe when we pray for more of Jesus, the miracle comes. Right? The miracle will happen. But it begins by desiring to grow to know God more deeply every single day. To allow His emptiness to fill your life. Jesus says, again, I am the bread of life. He doesn't say, I will give you bread. He says, I am the bread. Jesus didn't come to give us 10 steps to being a better person. He didn't come to give us five easy steps to healthy relationships. I love how J.D. Greer, pastor of the Summit Church, past president of the Southern Baptist, I love how he puts it. He says, Christianity is not a lifestyle. Christianity is not a lifestyle or a new way to live. It's a relationship. So if you're here looking for five steps to a better you, (laughs) five steps to get rid of my hunger, five steps for having hope, I don't have five steps, I have one. It's Jesus. It's a relationship. Christianity is a relationship with a person, plain and simple. How do I know that? Because in verses 35 through 40, Jesus uses three words 16 times. I, me, or my. 16 times he uses one of those three words. I, me, or my. And he does that because he wants to put himself at the center of history. Because this multitude had gone back to Moses. And they were grasping at Moses in the past. And Jesus says, it's not about Moses in the past. It's about Jesus here in the present. I want to be the center of history. The Torah, the five books of the Bible, right? The Whatever it is you're going through, I am the center. He wants to be more than a miracle worker. He wants to be the center of your life. He wants to be the bread of life sent by God to satisfy whatever hunger you have. Now, unfortunately, many respond to the claims of Jesus like this crowd did. uh, We can't end here without seeing the response of the crowd, right? Because we've been on this journey, right? Again, they're our main characters in this story. We've been on this journey of loving Jesus, right? Thank you for the bread. Let's, let's make sure we don't lose him. Where is he? Because he might do another miracle, right? To asking Jesus for this eternal bread that, that God is giving them, right? And God preaches this message. And then look how they respond, verse 43. Actually, verse 41. At this... The Jews began to, gr- to grumble about him, right? Began to grumble about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can you now say, I, come down, I came down from heaven? Right? They're saying, hey, I, know jo- I knew Joseph. Right? I know Mary. He grew up in Bethlehem. What do you mean he came down from heaven? Verse 43, Jesus says, stop grumbling among yourselves. Stop grumbling. And as the crowd began to complain and argue, Jesus didn't soften his message. This, these verses aren't up on the screen, but I'm going to read them if you're following along. Verse 44, he doesn't soften his message. Listen to what he says. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. Right, we're going to talk about this when we talk about the I am statement. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, and by the way, no one comes to the Father except by me. The gospel is great news. It's not just good news. It's, it's, it's great news. Jesus, the bread of life, that's the best news. Jesus, the resurrection of life, that's the best news. But to many, to to some in this crowd, to some here 
today in, in, in our neighborhood, in our in a community, in the world around us, the narrowness of the gospel is difficult to accept. It's ex- ex- exclusivity, right? We live in an inclusive world. It's exclusivity is offensive to some. Because Jesus again said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Not I am the way, the truth, and life. Oh, and by the way, there's another way and truth and life. Right? It's, it, it can be offensive to some. It can be offensive to some, and it was to this audience. And so there were three responses that happened in this story. Drop, go over to verse 66. The first response that some had, and that many have today to the narrowness of the gospel, the narrowness of the good news is open defection. Verse 66. From this time, after Jesus gives this amazing sermon about being the bread of life and eternal life, assurance of salvation, says from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They said, I've had enough. If you're not going to give us more miracles, I'm done. Right? Because it's all about me. Right? If you're not going to give me what I asked for, I'm going to leave. Jesus, right? And they did. They no longer followed him. Many will reject the gospel openly and permanently, and no amount of explaining or pleading will change them. It's only the Holy Spirit that can change them. It doesn't mean we don't share the gospel. We just know that sometimes, more often than not, we're going to be met with hostility, criticism, and at that point, all we can do is allow the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit can do, and that is draw them to God. The second reaction is found in verse 67, where Jesus says, he turns to his disciples, he says to the 12, he says, you don't want to leave me too, do you? Which to me is a very human question by Jesus. To me, this is where his humanity comes through. Right? He turns, he says, you don't want to leave me too, do you? I mean, they're all leaving. What about you guys? To which Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Right? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. I call this response firm determination. Firm determination. While Peter is often criticized, maybe the most criticized of the disciples, in this moment, his response to the hard teaching of Jesus is genuine belief. He didn't pretend to hand, understand everything Jesus was saying, but he tenaciously held on. He said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere because we've come to believe that you are who you say you are. And then finally, a third option to response, to responding to the gospel of Jesus is to reject Jesus, but pretend to be his follower. Reject Jesus by pretending to be his follower. Look at verse 70. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though one of the twelve was later to betray him. I've said this before. We're going to be shocked at who's in heaven and who's not. I can guarantee you, you are going to be shocked. You're going to be like, How'd you get here? And you're going to wonder, why are you not here? There's going to be well, there's many well-meaning churchgoers that fit into this category of rejecting Jesus but pretending to be his follower because of what's in it for them. That was the crowd, right? Motivated by works or like Judas, motivated by greed, motivated by popularity, by the popularity of Jesus, but not by faith. Three responses to Jesus laying it out. I'm the bread of life. I've been sent by God, by my Father, to provide for you, to fill your hunger, your spiritual hunger, to give you purpose, to give you hope, to give you a future that says in John 10, 10, right? I did not, I came to give you hope the the devil comes to steal and kill and destroy but i came i've come that you might have 
life and life to the full. So uh, I end with the question of Easter. Again, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Is he the great I am who is here with us and for us? He's here to be our light, our hope, and our salvation so that we do not have to fear. We do not have to fear things like death. We just don't. We don't have to fear it because we know that heaven waits for us and we know that those who have gone before us that have accepted Jesus wait for us. This brings us to the Lord's Supper where on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, kind of like he did on that mountain, on that, that hillside with the multitude. He took bread and he gave it to his disciples and said this represents my body and i know that's what I, I have to imagine that's what he was doing on that hillside that day he's giving them bread thinking this is so much more than just physical bread i wish you could understand that and he did the same to the disciples he handed them bread said you may not understand this now but you will in a couple days you're going to understand that this bread is my body this uh, and i am the bread of life. I'm going to go to the cross so that you and I can live forever. Think about that as we come to the communion table. Is Jesus the bread of life? Have you accepted the bread of life? Have you chosen him as the way, the truth, and the life? Are you allowing him as the shepherd to lead and to guide you this morning? this afternoon, this week, as you go through the struggles that you're going through. There's communion stations around. This is, this is how, how we're doing things. Um, we have self-serve communion stations. If you're not able to get up, Pastor Larry will bring it to you. But we're just going to give you a few moments to do some work in your own life. All right, to connect with your Heavenly Father to ask for forgiveness of sin, to tell him how much you love him, to thank him for sending Jesus. And then when you're ready, go grab both a bread, grab a cup and bring it back to your chair and then we will take them together here in just a few moments. Again, if you need it brought to you, just raise your hand and Pastor Larry will, will bring it to you.